Washington Smith, Smitty to his friends, no longer recognizes his backyard or the island where he has lived all his life. Hurricane Dorian stalled out over the eastern end of Grand Bahama Island, ravaging everything and everyone in its path. Dorian punched holes in concrete, tore houses from their foundations, and flung Smitty's 6,000-pound Humvee through a wall. Worse than the storm, Smitty told us, is the lack of government response over a week now after the storm first hit the Bahamas. Smitty, like many people, is running out of patience. Grand Bahama right now is dead. It's dead, and now let's make it waste. Let's make it waste. One, the hateful part about all of this, all of this happened in the East Grand Bahama, and I haven't seen a government official yet to come to say, well, here is a bottle of water, or to see what's going on. The damage to Smitty's home defies description. A wall of water crashed over this part of the island. Smitty and his teenage daughter survived. Many others did not. This is the hole that Hurricane Dorian punched in the house of Washington Smith. I should say one of the holes. Tore off his roof. Sent boards with nails flying at over 100 miles an hour through his house. Everywhere you go, you see, you see damage. You see how the shrapnel shredded the ceiling. Careful with this. You see a nail sticking out of a board that came flying through. And then the most frightening thing is you see where the water rose to. All along here. Came up, up, higher and higher, until here. This is over 20 feet high, and it stayed this high for 50 hours. He said it was 50 hours of pure torture. Little aid has reached this area. In many places, the only road in is blocked or underwater. As they wait for government assistance, some residents, like Marilyn Ling in the town of High Rock, have taken it upon themselves to organize a relief effort, distributing supplies donated by friends and family. Staying busy, she tells us, keeps her from reliving the horror of the storm. I have no words to, to say how bad. Um, maybe one in 10 house, one in 10 houses standing. There is silence in these hard-hit towns, the stench of death in the air as bodies are still being recovered. U.S. Coast Guard helicopters hovering low, residents say, usually means another victim of the storm has been found. There has never been a storm like Dorian before here. And from 1962, I ride out every storm here in Bevanstown. Is this, would you ride out the next storm? Um, no. I tell my daughter, I say, when I hear a storm coming now, by the help of the good Lord, I'll pack up and get as far to hell as I could from here. Dorian has scarred the Bahamas and Bahamians forever. Patrick Ottman, CNN, Grand Bahama Island. There is a massive aid effort underway right now in the Bahamas, and to talk more about that aspect of the recovery, let's bring in Luis David Rodriguez. Luis David, an emergency response manager with Direct Relief, joining this hour in Nassau. It's good to have you with us. Hi, good evening, George. Uh, look, good so, evening, everyone. Uh, food, water, medicine, uh, talk to us right now about how critical those items are for people so many days after Dorian made its mark there. Yeah, like you said, it's, it's all very critical, and um, especially in the in the area of Grand Bahama and Abaco, uh, especially Freeport and Harsh Bar Harsh Marsh Harbor in Abaco. Um, those people really need all the help they can get. Um, most of the people in in Marsh Harbor have been are being evacuated, uh, so so I could get exactly those needs back in Nassau. But still, there's a lot of people there with a lot of needs. Um, uh, especially food, water, and medical aid. And where you are there uh, in Nassau, it, it, things are, are, are somewhat normal. Obviously, that is the, the nerve center uh, of the, uh, the rescue uh, effort. But when you get out uh, to Grand Bahama Island, when you get to High Point, uh, when you get to Freeport, 
How difficult is it to get around there to reach people? Well, um, as you know, first of all, it's not as easy to get to those islands. Um, everybody's try trying to get out there to, to help in some way, somehow. So transportation is kind of difficult, actually, to find, find a way to get out there and help. It's not easy. Um, uh, once you get out there, communication is kind of still kind of fragile. It's not uh, not easy to, to to communicate with everyone there. So the, the assessment still in all of the islands is kind of tough to to find out where the need is actually, um, what's needed in what in what island throughout the area. I'm curious to ask you, uh, from an organization like yours, what is the planning? I mean, how do you fan out? How do you make sure that you reach all of those different areas? Because there are so many different areas that are affected here. Yeah, well, well you, you have to collaborate with, uh, obviously, the local government. Uh, for us, an example, with the Ministry of Health, and find out what their assessment and, and, and then the needs in the different places, where, where what have they assessed. And that way, you try to reach the most people as possible. Uh, for example, we, we got here on Tuesday and deliver some meds to March Harbor to the clinic. So start to, those, those critical medical aid people, we could get them meds as soon as possible before they're being evacuated to Nassau. From what you're seeing there on the ground, look, you know, I, I've been in, uh, you know, many of these places where storms hit hard. There's the short term where you make sure you reach the people, get people exactly what they need. Again, the food, water, medicine. Then the long term, uh, the look at recovery. How long do you think it'll take for both the short term and also the long term? Well, uh, being in, in, in Abac when March Harbor, everything destroyed. I mean, there's there's only a few, uh, a couple of buildings are since still standing up. This is going to take a long recovery effort. Um, I'm actually from Puerto Rico, um, mm. and being there two years ago with Hurricane Maria, I could definitely. Uh, I have experienced the long-term recovery and how long and what effort is going to take, and they do have a long, uh, long process ahead of them. But I think, um, from what I've seen, they're very resilient people, and they could definitely something um, they'll get they'll get around to, and and there's a lot of help coming in, so there'll be definitely be the support there for them. You know, look, given the fact that you have experienced a major storm coming through Puerto Rico, and you know the re the recovery effort after that. You know what it's like to go through this, as you say. So when you speak to people there, um, w what is the mood right now? Because the images that we're seeing, you know, here in the U.S. around the world, uh, the images are, are quite devastating. Yeah, you know what? Actually, um, uh, I can speak from my experience the last couple of days being in March Harbor and, and, and flying around some of the islands. You know, for, for, for these people who lost everything, literally they lost everything, their spirits are actually pretty high and, and pretty positive. Obviously, you see there is a, a little bit of the desperation and, and uncertainty, of, uncertainty of what's going to happen in the near future and, the, in, and in the long road ahead. And they, they're really, they don't know what's, what to expect. But, but these are, from what I've seen, they're receiving people and they're, they're uniting and helping each other in, in the efforts to recover. Luis David Rodriguez, we again pr appreciate your time and uh, certainly uh Thankful for all the work you and your group are doing there with people uh, in need of a lot of help. Thank you. Thank you.